But uh, 2 Corinthians 6, um, I just want to talk about um, prerequisites for marriage. What are things that I think if this is the case in that dating, then you should not get married. And I think the Bible is pretty clear on a couple of them. And the most obvious one is uh, in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, it says here, Be not, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And it goes on to talk about, you know, these two, what are they doing together? I think it's very clear in the Bible that God does not want us yoking up. And yoking up does not just mean hang, hanging around, because you might have some unsaved friends or whatever. But, you know, this is like a partnership. You know, they talk about the yoke on the two oxen pulling the cart. I mean, you're working together. You're very close. You're bound to one another. You know, so these types of relationships should not exist between a believer and an unbeliever. Why? Because it's dangerous because they're going to rub off on you. So I think the Bible is very clear. If the person you're dating is not saved, you, you cannot marry them. I don't necessarily mean that you cannot get to know them. Because is it wrong to get to know somebody who's not saved for the purpose of trying to get them saved? No, because it's no different to like getting together with an unsaved friend, right? And trying to get them saved and preaching them the gospel. I mean, as long as they're willing to, to catch up with you and keep talking about the Bible and are really interested in whether or not they should believe on Jesus Christ, yeah, keep meeting up with them, you know, and, and, and get them saved, even if, even if they don't uh, um, end up getting married to you. So that's definitely the case. It was the case with me and Elizabeth, you know, she was not saved when we met. And then she eventually got saved and then we got married. So I don't think there's anything sinful about um, dating somebody uh, for the purpose of uh, preaching the gospel to them. You're really just soul winning. Um, but the same danger is there. Because obviously if you are dating somebody to give them the gospel, the same danger is there that the emotional and the physical side is going to move quicker than the philosophical side. And one of the most important ones is philosophically you're the same on salvation. Because you can't even, it's a sin to marry her or marry him if you're not even saved. So when, when, you're, when, you, when they don't get saved, are you going to break that relationship? If you, you know, you, you get along so well and all that sort of stuff. So that same danger is there that we have to be aware of. So definitely you cannot marry somebody that is not saved. So you need to either find somebody that is saved or get them saved before you marry them. 2 Corinthians 7.36, it says here, But if a man, any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and needs so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. So I think another requirement is, is you know, the woman obviously has to be of age, right? She has to, she, she has to be, you know, have her period, right, and be a woman. So no, no prepubescent women, Muhammad, okay? Um, so that she has to be passed... She has to be past the flower of her age, I think is very clear. Uh, now, I don't have the verse for this one, but then this, um, and I've covered this in the last couple of um, ones, but just the fact that, you know, because uh, a woman belongs to her father and she can't make a vow without her father, she needs her permission. So I think that is one of the requirements of marriage is you need the father's permission in order to marry this woman because he could technically veto that vow. And his, position, his permission may not be positive, it just means that he's not against it, right? Because if he allows that vow to pass, like we read in Numbers, then you are able to marry that woman. So that's the third requirement. You do need the father's permission. And some things I just want to mention on that point is you don't need an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend's permission. Because they, they, don't, they, they don't belong to that person. And we shouldn't expect that from our ex-boyfriends or ex-girlfriends. You know what I mean? I, I remember I was dating a girl once and uh, we dated for a couple of years and then we broke up. And then this guy called me in order to ask whether it was all right for him to date her. And I was like, she doesn't belong to me. Like, of course you can. But I can imagine that a lot of people would expect that wouldn't they? They'd expect that from their friend, wouldn't they? Like you'd, if you were dating a girl and then your friend went and dated her, I personally don't think you should expect that. I mean, if you're good friends and you know it's going to hurt your friend, should you do that to, 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 to love your friend? Yeah, I think yeah, you probably should if you know that it's um, something that you know, your friend was going through. But I think from our side of the coin, because we can't change what other people do, we should not expect it because you do not, but that girl that you didn't work out with doesn't belong to you. 
So, she, so the guy that's going to go date doesn't need your permission because you, you don't have nothing to do with it. And likewise with a girl, you don't need another girl's permission to date a guy um, because they don't belong to them. Um, and the question came up about the father's permission. You know, when do you get the father's permission? Do you get the father's permission at the very beginning to even start dating the girl? Do you get the father's permission to be more serious? Do you only get the father's permission once you've decided to marry and now you're getting the father's permission to marry? Uh, I personally think you need the father's permission from the beginning because technically, you know, you, know you, don't, you can't even see his daughter if you don't have his permission, right? Because he could just tell his daughter that you're not going to see him. So whether you, when you formally ask, I think it's best as early as possible but um, I think if you're clear in your intentions and the father knows, you know, I'm dating this girl because I'm looking for a wife, um, his response will probably be different to, well, you're just hanging out with my daughter and who, I don't know who you are, I don't know what your intentions are. So when to get the father's permission? Technically, you need the father's permission from the get-go because you need his permission to even see his daughter. Um, I mean, if he's allowed his daughter to just hang out with whoever, then technically you have that permission there. But if you don't want him to veto your vow, it's probably best that you're very clear with him what your intentions are and what you want to do so that he allows you to marry his daughter. Okay, so you have to have the father's permission. So she's saved. She's uh, a woman, past the flower of her age. You have the father's permission. Now, I think as well, uh, Genesis 2. Oh, wait, I think it's 2. Genesis 2.24. Just this verse, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So I believe, you know, a man should be ready to leave father and mother in order to get married. So this is, would be one of my no-goes to say, you know, is the man ready to leave? You know, is the man ready to leave in order to start this new family? So the questions that come up is, you know, should you be working? Should you have your own place? I personally think you should be working. I think you should be responsible financially responsible for your family doesn't necessarily mean you live in your own house um, because I think the idea is you know the Bible says if any provide not for his own even for they that are his own house he is denied the faith and is worse than an infidel so I think the man has to be ready to provide both financially and be responsible for his family in order to to get married right you can't be you know just studying and you're still getting paid for and then you want to get married you may not be living in a new place because, you know, a lot of cultures, you can't afford a new house. They live with their parents and they live in separate rooms of the house or in granny flats and things like that. So that might be your arrangement. That not, not, is not necessary. But what I'm getting at is you realize that your responsibility as a man is to care for this new family. If your family is not provided for, it's your fault, you know, and it's the man's responsibility. That's why it says a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. So I think the man should be ready to, to leave father and mother. That's number four. Uh, number five is that they're not currently married. I mean, obviously, if they're, not, if they're currently married, meaning that they have, and even if they've been divorced, see, this is what is, we have to be careful of, because if somebody has been divorced legally, but they didn't divorce lawfully, meaning a biblical divorce, then they're still married to that person, and you can't marry that person. Because if they're still married in the eyes of God, that's called adultery. That's no longer called marriage. So they have to not be currently married in the eyes of God. Um, number six, we read in Leviticus 6, the different relational ties that are unlawful. You know, marrying your father, marrying your uncle and aunt, and these different relational ties that are unlawful. So obviously, if the relational tie is unlawful, then that's a no-go on marriage. Now, this might be controversial, but I do not believe that brother and sister is a sin to get married. I don't think it's wise just because of the genetics behind it. But if you go back and listen to my sermons on marriage, I explain why I don't believe it can be a sin. And the short answer is, is because obviously Cain and Abel had to marry their sister. And if it was a sin, how could God put them in a situation to sin? So I believe that's why it's not given the death sentence. But if you read in uh, Leviticus 20, you'll see the different relational ties that are sinful and are not lawful. Um, now beyond those six, so that was that, saved, female past the flower of age, father's permission, man ready to leave father and mother, not currently married, and the relational tie is lawful. I might have missed some. If I missed some, just let me know afterwards. But see, beyond those, I really think it's just a matter of choice. 
and it's a matter of wisdom, right? Beyond those things, because people will generally ask questions about these things to determine, is this person okay for me to marry? And what are these things that are beyond those? One might be their spiritual maturity. You know, how mature do they need to be before it's a no-go zone? I don't know whether there is a right and wrong answer to that. You know, for me, I think it's wise that you find somebody that's heading in the same direction. You know, they may be spiritually younger, but if you're heading in the same direction, then I think you'll have a successful relationship. Um, you know, what about looks? You know, it's not wrong to desire somebody that you're attracted to. I do definitely think in the grand scheme of things, it's vain because, you know, come 20 or 30 years, it, they're not going to be as attractive as you first met them. That's just the reality of it. And for those of us who are married, we know. You know, even if you married a really beautiful woman, which I believe I did, you know, is she, is she as attractive as I felt she was the day we met? Of course not. You know, she knows that too. I mean, it's just realistic. But that's not what's binding our relationship together. You know, it's not wrong to marry somebody that you're attracted to, but it shouldn't be the highest on your list. Um, because it is vain. Because when, when 20, 30 years go past, they, I mean, they're not, after they have a couple of kids even, they're not going to be the same shape as they were when you first met them. And you know, most girls, if they, just, if they were just healthy, you know, they'd be attractive. You know, most girls, if they, if they were just healthy and just looked after themselves, it's not about, you know, uh, what's the latest thing, like CrossFit? You know, it doesn't have to be some CrossFit girl that can like do like 100 sit-ups and 100 bench presses or whatever. You know, I don't think that's what it takes just to be healthy and attractive for a lady. It just means just eating right. You know, and eating right doesn't mean, you know, you, you work an eight-hour shift and you eat nothing for breakfast and then for lunch you have like a cracker with a slice of cheese and a slice of tomato on it. And then you have like nothing until dinner and dinner, I don't know what girls have for dinner, like a can of tuna or something like that. I mean, that's not healthy. You know, I, I see people at, at work eating like that. I'm just thinking, you know, how you, 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 this is why you're struggling to lose weight because you're starving your body and your body's like packing on all this fat because it's, cause it thinks it's going to die, you know. <laughs> That's how the body works. You can look it up. You know, if you, if you starve your body, your body goes into starvation mode. And then when you eat things, it now starts storing fat rather than feeding the muscle and using up the fat because it thinks you're starving. That's why people know if you want to keep your metabolism up, you need to eat at regular intervals because it keeps your metabolism going. And what you eat is going to be important too. You know, if you're just eating sugar, you know, you starve yourself and then you have cake and donuts at work. I mean, that's, that's going to make you put on weight, you know? because you're just not looking after your health. So healthy does not mean eat nothing at all, um, except for the, you know, I say the cruskets with the cheese and, I just don't know how they do that. I see the girls at work and they, get, they prepare their lunch and they get out two pieces of cruskets and they slice their cheese into it. And that's all they have, or they have a noodle cup. And I'm just like, I can eat a noodle cup for lunch. It's like the worst lunch ever. And they're like, how does that even fill you up? I don't know. It's like, it's like flour in, in water, flavored water. Um, so, you know, looks, that's one. Uh, purity. You know, like I said, it's not a requirement. I do think it's important if you're giving the, the pretense that you're pure and you're not. But, um, you know, do you, is it important that somebody is pure or not? You know, for you it might be important, for others it might not be important. For me it wasn't that, that big a deal, you know. <clears throat> so purity, it's not, not a requirement. It's just a loss of a blessing, obviously, because fornication... You know, because fornication is not the death penalty. You know, fornication in, in the Bible, if you fornicate with a girl, you should just be forced to marry her. If your father doesn't want to give her in marriage, then you need to pay the dowry, uh, pay, pay the penalty. So it, it's not the death penalty. So it's not a, uh, a no-go zone if somebody is impure, right? It's just, uh, it's just a loss of a blessing. So uh, purity, what have we got? spiritual maturity looks, purity, some other examples. Uh, how responsible are they? Um, how financially stable they are, you know, well, what's your fi financial stability? And obviously this is uh, 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 subjective, isn't it? And is there any even such thing as financial stability? Because you could marry the guy that has all the money in the world and then he gets sick and loses it all. Is that what you're basing your decision on? So I don't know that's important. I think it's more so uh, responsibility, you know, does he realize that he's responsible for taking care of the finances of the house? Uh, you know, different interests. You might. You don't want the same interests, personality, ethnicity and culture, life skills, experience. I will say this though, when it comes to things that are beyond the no-go zones, is, you know, don't be a hypocrite with your criteria. You know what I mean? Like, if you want a pure girl and you're not pure, I mean, you're a bit of a hypocrite, right? To say, well, I want a virgin, but I'm not even a virgin. You know, I want a girl that has never liked anyone before, but yet I've liked other people before. I mean, this is a, this is a bit hypocritical, isn't it? Um, 
And, you know, be graceful. You know, because you might want this perfect person, this perfect virgin or whatever, but it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, Christ forgave them. Christ loves them the way they are and accepted them and wants to help them. So, you know, do you want somebody that's just like ready-made or do you want to take somebody that's imperfect and make them better? Do you know? So, so be graceful and have that Christ-like spirit when it comes to who you choose to marry. They don't need to be perfect. If you want somebody that's perfect, it's not necessarily wrong to desire things above what are the no-go zones. But, you know, just ask yourself, is, is what, what level are you going to take it to and is it, is it important? So the last two questions I just want to address is um, generally when it comes to dating, and I want to end on this question, uh, there's two questions I have, but one question is how do I know I've chosen the person according to God's will? That's generally the question that people ask. Young people ask that. Like, how do I know this is God's will for me, this person? And, and really the, what we've covered in this series is, I hope you've realized, well, it's because it's a choice, right? And we have now here the guidelines of what God the boundaries in which God allows us to choose. So if they meet the no-go zones, which is, you know, they say, the past flower, you know, the things that I covered, then really it's your choice. So within those bounds of marriage, any girl within those boundaries, it's God's will for you. As opposed to thinking that there is one girl that is God's will for you and you are trying to find that one girl, you need to realize that the situation is we are given boundaries and all the girls within that boundary are God's will for you. It's just which one do you want to marry? So when I married Elizabeth, I knew it was God's will for me because she met the no-go zones and I wanted to marry her. So you see how, how I know that it's God's will for me to marry this girl? Because I know what God does not want me to marry. Elizabeth goes, fits within those criteria and I wanted to marry her. So that's God's will. And this is how you can have assurance. Because when I was a young person, that's always the question that boggled my mind is how do I know that this is the girl that God wants me to marry? But when I realized it was a choice I had to make within the boundaries that God had given me, then I had that assurance that when I married her, I was doing what God wanted me to do because I knew what God expected from me.